One of the usual tear-jerking but utterly false stories about Muhammad is that he died a poor man. Sahih al-Bukhari 3.283 narrated by Qatada. An ass went to the Prophet with barley bread having some dissolved fat on it. The Prophet had mortgaged his armor to a Jew in Medina and took from him some barley for his family. An ass heard him saying, The household of Muhammad did not possess even a single sack of wheat or food grains for the evening meal, although he has nine wives to look after. Just like all the other tens of thousands of stories concocted about Muhammad by his followers over a period of 300 years, this one also can be easily disproved and as usual based entirely upon the records of Muhammad and Islam. Muhammad was a poor man to start with, but his financial fortunes changed dramatically when the 40 years old, very successful Meccan merchant Khadija bin Khuwaylid proposed to and married Muhammad at age 25. Although he was allegedly illiterate, nonetheless, he was somehow able to trade, buying and selling, counting, bargaining and contracting, etc. Khadija's wealth was so substantial that Muhammad did not have to earn a living and hence was able to spend a lot of time alone, presumably contemplating the universe. By the way, there is no mention whatsoever of Muhammad ever earning a living through hard work after Khadija's death, nor whatever happened to her assets after she died. These important items are very conveniently never addressed by Muslims. Unfortunately for the followers of Muhammad, we are now publicly asking these questions that require serious answers from the so-called scholars of Islam. Since, according to the hadiths, Khadija was reputedly very wealthy, why are there many other hadiths that describe Muhammad as being in penury? He should have inherited her wealth, after all. What happened to her wealth? How could it have vanished so mysteriously? Muhammad allegedly received his first revelation at age 40. From then until Khadija died when he was 49, we have no information about how he earned a living, especially since there is no mention that he was still trading. Nor do we have any reports that when Khadija died, she and Muhammad were in a poor financial state. I ask again the simple and logical question. What happened to Khadija's wealth that caused Muhammad to be poor? Why are these simple and very important questions never addressed by the so-called scholars of Islam? Why not? Is this why, after his escape to Medina, Muhammad became the head of the first organized crime syndicate in history? I would like our audience to always remember that Muhammad, the alleged peace-loving, just, merciful and compassionate Prophet of Allah, composed a surah or chapter called Al-Anfal, chapter 8, meaning the spoils of war, specifically created to have Allah sanction and justify Muhammad's slaughter and plunder of the wealth and enslavement of the survivors of all those who disagreed or opposed him, be they pagan Arabs, Christian Arabs, or Judaized Arabs. Al-Anfal, or Spoils of War, 8.41. And know that out of all the booty that ye may capture, a fifth share is assigned to Allah and to the Apostle. Sahih Muslim Hadith 4328, narrated by Sa'ad ibn Abu Waqqas. Mus'ab ibn Sa'ad said, My father took a sword from the khums, meaning the fifth share of the booty, and brought it to the Prophet and said, Grant it to me. Muhammad refused. At this, Allah revealed Al-Anfal 8.1. They asked thee concerning the spoils of war. Say, the spoils of war are for Allah and the Apostle. Ladies and gentlemen, please be aware how clever Muhammad was by first assigning 20% of all booty and plunder to himself and Allah. Since Allah could not take his 10% share of the plunder and booty, it is obvious that the whole of the 20% was taken by the sly Muhammad. Secondly, when Muhammad was confronted with a disputed item of plunder, he had another one of his made to order revelations, asserting that all booty is solely at the discretion of Muhammad and Allah. Once again, since Allah is not actually a participant in the sharing of the booty, thus, all the plunder is very conveniently left in the hands of Muhammad to deal with as, how and when he pleased. What a lovely partnership we have here. 
both Muhammad and his Allah enjoy the spoils resulting from the slaughter, enslavement, plunder and booty of Allah's predestined humanity. This predestined humanity is called unbelieving or disbelieving infidels or kuffar. Since they are kuffar, Muhammad and his murderous thugs are sanctioned by Allah to have them dealt with at will. Muhammad and his Allah are the unbeatable duo of piracy. Sunan Abu Dawood Hadith 2742 narrated by Habib Ibn Maslam al-Fihri. The Apostle of Allah would give a third of the spoils after he would keep off the fifth. Sunan Abu Dawood 3013 narrated by Ibn Shihab. The Apostle of Allah took out his fifth from the booty of Khaybar and divided the rest of it among those who attended the battle. Sunan Abu Dawood, Book 19, Number 2961, narrated Umar ibn al-Khattab. Malik ibn Aws al hatsan said, One of the arguments put forward by Umar was that he said that the Apostle of Allah received three things exclusively to himself, Banu Nadir, Khaybar, and Fadak, so-called believers and unbelieving kuffar. Banu Nadir, Khaybar, and Fadak were tribes and agricultural villages that belonged to the industrious and successful native Judaized Arabs whose wealth Muhammad coveted and plundered for himself. Just after Muhammad died, Sahih al-Bukhari 4.325 narrated by Aisha. After the death of Allah's Apostle, Fatima, the daughter of Allah's Apostle, asked Abu Bakr Siddiq to give her her share of inheritance from what Allah's Apostle had left of the Fay, i.e. booty gained without fighting, which Allah had given him. Abu Bakr said to her, Allah's Apostle said, Our property will not be inherited. Whatever we, i.e. prophets, leave is sadaqah to be used for charity. Fatima, the daughter of Allah's Apostle, got angry and stopped speaking to Abu Bakr. She continued assuming this attitude till she died. Fatima remained alive for six months after the death of Allah's Apostle. She used to ask Abu Bakr for her share from the property of Allah's Apostle, which he left at Khaybar and Fadak, and his property at Medina. Abu Bakr refused to give her that property and said, I will not leave anything that Allah's Apostle used to do, because I'm afraid that if I left something from the Prophet's tradition, then I would go astray. Ladies and gentlemen, the following is a gem of an extremely important dialogue that must not be overlooked, which I would like to share with you. When Ali, the husband of Fatima, was confronted by Abu Bakr with the reason for his rejection of giving them Muhammad's wealth, telling him it was because Muhammad asserted that prophets cannot be inherited. At this, Ali, who had written down his own version of the Quran as recited to him by Muhammad, correctly stated that Muhammad was ignorant of his own book by pointing out that actually Muhammad's Quran clearly mentions that prophets did leave inheritance for their sons as in the following verses. Surah An-Naml 27.16 And Solomon was David's heir. Surah Miriam 19.5 Now I fear what my relatives and colleagues will do after me. But my wife is barren, so give me an heir as from thyself one that will truly represent me and represent the posterity of Jacob. Ali pointed this out to the group assembled there, leaving them silent and unable to respond, because they were shocked that he proved Muhammad wrong. After all, this was Muhammad's own Quran, and he got it wrong. All Abu Bakr could do in response, knowing Ali was correct, was to say, well, that's the way it's going to be. Sahih Muslim, Book 19, Number 4351. It is narrated on the authority of Aisha. When the Messenger of Allah passed away, his wives made up their minds to send Uthman bin Affan as their spokesman to Abu Bakr to demand from him their share from the legacy of the Holy Prophet. At this, Aisha said to them, Hasn't the Messenger of Allah said, We prophets do not have any heirs? What we leave behind is to be given to charity? Dear listeners, I thought it best to recite the following gem last. Sahih al-Bukhari 5.743, narrated by Aisha. The Prophet died while his armor was mortgaged to a Jew for 30 sa' of barley. 
How can any moral and logical person accept anything in Muhammad's Quran or Hadith as either divine or true when we find out that Muhammad contradicted his own Quran and Aisha, the mother of the believers, deceiving us by telling us the absurd story of how poor Muhammad died when his other wives, his daughter Fatima, his son-in-law and nephew Ali and his cousin Al-Abbas were demanding their share of a substantial inheritance? I leave it to all of you so-called believers and unbelieving kuffar to ponder and assess. One of the usual tear-jerking but utterly false stories about Muhammad is that he died a poor man. Sahih al-Bukhari 3.283 narrated by Qatada. Anas went to the Prophet with barley bread having some dissolved fat on it. The Prophet had mortgaged his armor to a Jew in Medina and took from him some barley for his family. Anas heard him saying, the household of Muhammad did not possess national fortunes changed dramatically when the 40 years old, very successful Meccan merchant Khadija bin Khuwailid proposed to and married Muhammad at age 25. Even a single sa' of wheat or food grains for the evening meal, although he has nine wives to look after. Just like all the other tens of thousands of stories concocted about Muhammad by his followers over a period of 300 years, this one also can be easily disproved and as usual based entirely upon the records of Muhammad and Islam. Muhammad was a poor man to start with, but his final